consumers and become one of the most potent symbols of a national cuisine. The mushroom is generally known by its Japanese name, Matsutake, which means pine mushroom. As in Japan, it grows in pine forests. In the last 20 years, China has become the world's key producer of this mushroom, and within China, the Southwest is the place of greatest abundance. And here's a photo of it as it's picked. Here are a few happy pickers. So since the mid-1990s, I have been working in this region, especially trying to understand its role in shaping transnational circulations of ideas, people, and goods. And for those of you who are not sure where Yunnan is, it's right here, the capital, Kunming is here. I'll have a slide later showing the river systems. I'm mainly working um, up here now and previously down uh, in this part near the Mekong River. So as was uh, just mentioned by Professor Singh, that my first book, Invent Environmental Winds, shows how Chinese villagers, scientific experts, and activists were not only engaging with powerful forms of global environmentalism, but they were also shaping forms of environmentalism that circulated around the globe. Environmental Winds uses accounts of China's role to challenge more typical notions that other social movements such as feminism, civil or gay rights are first invented in the West and subsequently flow to other places around the world. So this new project is less explicitly around environmental issues in terms of environmentalism, but it's more about ways humans make a living from the natural world, which we are, lest we forget, always deeply reliant on. But then in reflecting on those terms, you can think about from the natural world or reliant on, those seem to suggest a kind of separateness. So another way to describe this is to follow Karen Berard's acknowledgement that we are part of that nature that we seek to understand. or not, is it precipitates surprising cultural revivals and more. In terms of science, while researchers have sequenced the DNA of the Matsutake and undertaken Herculean efforts to cultivate it, including investments of millions of dollars and years of research by some of Japan's top scientists in some of the best laboratories, nonetheless, Matsutake refuses to grow by human command. It doesn't grow in a lab. So many people, in first hearing about this, are expecting human innovation to win out, might find this surprising. I did. But many of us are also somewhat interested in trying to understand the limits of human hubris. So as much as these lab experiments still ongoing have failed, the mushroom economy, mainly in other species of mushrooms that humans raise, is huge. Globally, we are talking about an annual trade of probably in the range of 25 to 45 billion dollars a year. And just to give you a comparison, coffee exports are much less, more like around 10 or 15 billion dollars a year. So that's surprising to many people. 
The wild mushroom market mainly consists of four types, bow wheats, chanterelles, morels, and matsutake. And the matsutake make up a large share, sometimes reaching three or four billion dollars a year alone. Such figures, though, are hard to know with precision, as this trade is almost always black market, cash and carry, under the table. And as far as I know, almost no matsutake pickers anywhere are wage laborers, official employees who are on the books. Trading companies are often quite secretive about their sources and their strategies, especially as this is one of the world's most rapidly fluctuating commodities in terms of value. Recently, matsutake sells for about $30 a kilogram, but over a decade ago, it was pushing $1,000 per kilogram. And there are many stories about the gold rush in the woods, including Oregon. Prices can even change within a single day. In this volatile context, pickers and dealers strive to be nimble, working to expand their social networks and stay abreast of a highly idiosyncratic demand. As a research collective, we use this species to explore larger topics, such as novel understandings of how capitalism works, how science travels across national borders, and so forth. Our first monograph, Anna Singh's book, The Mushroom at the End of the World, was just published a few months ago. And today's talk is based on my own book manuscript, which is a work in progress, the second book in what we're calling a Matsutake trilogy. So the rest of this talk has three parts. First, I'll briefly discuss the <laughs> human seriously is quite novel. Western intellectual and political legacy is almost thoroughly anthropocentric. Social theory of all kinds has been typically concerned with only one kind of animal, humans. While it might not be surprising that fields like geography would show interest in the more than human, for my own field of anthropology, the study of humankind, interest in the more than human is less expected. There's an archaeologist named Severed Fowles who has a funny comment on how outsiders see what is happening in my field with some confusion. He says, it is easy to understand the puzzlement of colleagues who are unaware of what to make of the increasing number of anthropologists who are more and more bemoaning anthropocentrism. Seems like an oxymoron. So one simple way to describe my travels between China and Japan has been in terms of a commodity chain. Such a metaphor often approaches the object in a relatively straightforward way, showing how humans will disentangle an object, such as a fish, an apple, or a shovel full of silver ore from the earth and transform it, often along several links in a chain, into a commodity for human consumption. A chain is often seen as linear, where the object quickly becomes under fully human control. A chain tends to, not, er, tends to look at only one object, not its relationship to others. In today's talk, however, I draw on the metaphor of a network to explore the kinds of worlds that are built around this mushroom. Mushroom pickers, dealers, and consumers turn this living organism into slices of mushroom flesh on a charcoal brazier, sprinkled with sea salt and drizzled with uzu citrus juice. A network is better than a chain in describing the expansive worlds of people who are now mobilized around the mushroom. Foresters who study its ecological relations, bench scientists who try, still try to domesticate it in the lab, pickers and dealers in China who use Matsutake money to create new forms of sociality and foster ethnic revival. Politicians and businessmen in Japan and North Korea who appreciate its use as symbolic capital to nurture international diplomacy or lubricate multi-million dollar construction contracts, as often happens in Japan. If one, like myself, wants to understand these networks and include non-human actors as well, they might turn to actor network theory. Starting in the 1980s, this was invented and promoted by scholars such as Bruno Latour, Michelle Calon, Anne-Marie Moll, John Law, and others. It has attracted a lot of attention across a number of fields. It has been taken up, used, and challenged by scholars working on the more than human, such as Sarah Watmore. And Donna Haraway. 
Many know it by the acronym of ANT, and as even Latour himself says, ANT is not really a theory. So I'm assuming that perhaps half of you know what ANT is about, and so for those of you that don't, I'll just offer a brief synopsis by John Law. And he suggests that ANT is a disparate family of material semiotic tools, sensibilities, and methods of analysis that treat everything in the social and natural worlds as a continuously generated effect of the webs of relations within which they are located. It assumes that nothing has reality or form outside the enactment of those relations. So it's all on the relation. Its studies explore and characterize the webs and the practices that carry them. Okay, that's what law says. So in the terms of A&T, what law calls the social and natural worlds are not seen as divided, but infused or co-constituted. In the language of A&T, all things that play some role in making things happen are described using a term called actus, a term that works against anthropocentric frameworks where only humans count as actors. Likewise, typical definitions of agency are often premised on intentionality, an attribute often regarded as only possessed by humans. A&T, however, challenges these long-standing notions. Ironically, a few scholars have pointed out that even though ANT is framed as an alternative to anthropocentrism, in practice, most ANT accounts tend to do otherwise. Most accounts have followed scientists in their activities, showing how in conducting their experiments and making knowledge claims, they build networks. But in many of these cases, it seems that in fact, it is only really humans that are doing the enrolling of others and not the not the other way around. Although I make this critique of an often subtle but enduring anthropocentrism in ANT, one of the few approaches, um, this is still one of the few approaches that aims to dethrone human centrality. And my own research project does not aim to displace humans entirely. Rather, I aim to include them within a wider realm of sociality with non-humans. In terms of the book that I am writing, the first half of the book will move sequentially from the mushroom's fruiting body to its interactions with tree roots, other fungi, and insects. The second half of the book explores what happens after the mushroom is picked by people in China and it travels to Japan. My interest in a mushroom's life before its direct encounter with humans was piqued by two realizations. So the first, I was interested in taking the mushrooms seriously as their own beings and became intrigued by how they are semiotic agents. In other words, they interpret signals from other species as well as produce their own. I knew that animals may communicate in unexpected ways, and I heard murmurings of plant communication but I didn't know, in terms of the science, this being new to me, what was more cutting edge, what was more bleeding edge. And I was thinking this morning, you know, reflecting on this, that Berkeley is probably especially one of those places in the world where people are thinking about this every day, trying to figure out what is cutting edge, what is not. <laughs> but um, so is trying to figure this out, this, this reading this mycology, reading about the potential for these fungi to communicate with other species. And previously, I had not heard that mushrooms were capable of this, especially beyond the fungal kingdom. But the more I learned, the more I wanted to write about this novel way of understanding the world, more lively at the level of non-human perception, action, and interaction than I had realized. So the second thing was that last year, a mycologist remarked to me that most Matsutake live their lives without humans ever picking them. Even though in China there may be as many as half a million pickers and perhaps 10,000 in America, she said that most lie hidden under the forest duff or beyond the daily circuits of the pickers. Based on my own experience of hunting Matsutake, I knew that most are only spotted about 10 or 20 feet away. They are scattered over much sparsely populated terrain and they grow and disappear quite quickly within just a few weeks oftentimes, but I had assumed before that most were picked by people. Clearly, 
The matsutake is not passive, and most of them, unlike plants such as corn or animals like domesticated pigs, live beyond realms totally managed by humans. Thus, I ask, what does it mean to pay attention to the liveliness of this being? What if, instead of looking at it as a natural resource or a commodity, we explore how it is a truly active player that is both enrolled and enrolls others? What kinds of worlds does the mushroom create, or at least participate in? So let's turn to studies from a &T to see how they think. The attempted domestication of the scallop in France. Famously, in the story, the scallop refuses the scientists in France. It is not enrolled in their project to domesticate it. The failure of the scallop to be enrolled to be domesticated sparks a number of commentators to ask, paraphrasing Gayatri Spivak's famous question, can the subaltern speak into the shellfish equivalent? As you can guess, can the scallop speak? In ANT, non-humans like the scallop seem to have two choices, to be willing or unwilling to join human-centered projects. But what happens when we open our capacity to notice what the scallop and other critters do within and beyond human-centered projects. Now this entails starting our analysis before humans appear as a center actor. To better understand the ways that Matsutake makes its world, sometimes in ways that humans are directly part of and sometimes not. The Matsutake could be argued builds a kind of network itself. Thus, in the larger project, I look at a number of actants I look at a number of actants who are part of the Matsutake's life, the networks it is part of, including trees such as pines and oaks who provide an environment in which Matsutake may grow, and insects who seek it out as a source of food, hunting ground, or nourishment for their young. Diverse forms of chemical communication are floating through the air and also passing through the soil on mycelial networks. Fungi and insects listen closely to avoid predators, to seek food, find mates, and so on. In the language of ANT, we might say that the fungus enrolls other beings in its life project, but I would like to signal my ambivalence about this term, in part because it may be freighted with notions of intentionality, as well as notions of durability, not just in this case, but in any situation, but that's for another discussion. So what kinds of networks do fungus build? I'll give you just a little taste right now. Let's start with the spores. Fungi travel in many ways. Some are ejected or catapulted from the fungal body at tremendous speeds through ingenious microscopic devices. Others, like the truffle, use animal power to travel over space. Truffles create a complex chemical brew that can somehow penetrate soil up to a meter thick. This brew produces an enticing smell, capturing the attention of a wandering wild pig or a trained truffle dog attracting a flying squirrel or even a beetle, which digs up the prize and carries the fungal spores to other locations in its own gut, expanding its range. Yet other fungi design spores to be carried by the wind. Spores are not seeds. To germinate, they need to find other sexually compatible spores. And they need to exist on the right kind of surface with the right kind of conditions that allow the potential for them to fuse together. Splore, spores explore their neighbor's compatibility. So this is not a binary sex system of male and female, rather spore sexuality exists in hundreds of types, which are only compatible with the one or few other types, making spore fusing a challenge, even though some fungi produce absolutely prodigious numbers of spores. Some experts claim that there can be more spores produced in a puffball here than there are stars in our galaxy. Uh, there have actually been some studies showing that they're trying to look at what would happen if every single spore from this puffball were to grow, and you know some will get to be up to four or five pounds. If you can imagine there are more spores than there are stars in the galaxy, quickly, it would just send the Earth out of its circuit. I mean, we would be doomed if it just happened in, in one year. But luckily, they don't. So these spores, which can cross entire oceans if the wind currents are just right, are just one of fungi's reproductive capacities that deviate from our typical understandings of them 
as like plants, but different. They are often regarded as passivist plants, as sessile beings whose lives unfold in fixed, predictable ways, unable to really engage with the world. Viewing them as actants helps us show mushrooms' active engagement with other fungi and across kingdom lines in terms of their relations with plants and animals, including humans. Their material being, including their reproduction, confounds human management models that are often built on organisms such as tree or deer. Understandings of fungal lives can help us to challenge models built on specific organisms, like this, and then often generalized to stand for all forms of life, rather than attending to what can be some dramatic differences. So these are just a few of the ways that fostering a curiosity about fungal capacities might open up our perspectives on the world of human. So at this point, um, more than halfway through, I'm going to switch gears and show us more of what happens after humans are involved in the microcosm. And now. and other grains and herding yaks in the mountains. And I also worked in another part of Yunnan, spending time with ethnic key farmers in another place, um, famous for its matsutake, but I'll save that for another time. So here we are with a map of Yunnan. And most of this area that I'm working at um, with the ethnic Tibetans is up in the top uh, left side. So in the northwest, you probably can't read it on the map, but that uh, highest town there is called Zhongdian. And that's the big turn, by the way, of the, of the Yangtze River. So it's up there, high in the Tibetan plateau. Okay. So the summer monsoons are winding to a close, and frost is appearing on the higher peaks. Here's a view from um, one of the places I spent some time. Standing at dawn during the late summer and the early fall, one can discover an interesting sight. It looks like the stars are emerging, but in reverse, for the night is ending rather than beginning. One is not looking up into the sky, but down into the valley as hundreds of lights flicker from the villages below. Unlike stars in the sky, these points of light are moving. They are flashlights carried by villagers walking up into the mountains to hunt for the Matsutake, called Songrong in Mandarin Chinese, a name referring to the pine tree, Song, and the mushroom's visual resemblance to deer antlers that are in velvet, that's that softness called rong. In Tibetan, one of the names people use is basha, or oak mushroom, as in this place, actually, they're associated high up with evergreen oak trees. So these Tibetan pastoralists, from eight years old to 80, it is often said, collect all morning and then return home when the dealers arrive at a village market or drive along the roads buying from mushroom dealers as they go. Um, so this is one of the scenes where I was accompanying a dealer for several days when he's looking at um, the morning harvest from this woman. They're trying to figure out a price together. The mushrooms are carried in a, <clears throat> a shoulder satchel, often hand fashioned from bags once used for fertilizer or pig food, the durable everyday sack of rural China. When hunters find a prized specimen, they wrap it in a layer of thin plastic film like this, or they may snap off the tip of a rhododendron branch place the mushroom against it and wrap grass around the mushroom, cinching it tightly like a baby in a cradle. The mushrooms are carefully cushioned in these satchels as they may be easily damaged during the long hike over steep terrain. Over the season, millions of mushrooms travel from villages to local buying centers and bulking stations and then to Japan, all within 48 hours, for they are very delicate and insects are already starting to eat them from the inside out. Here's a photo of one of the most common ones, the fungus gnat, that can somehow detect the mushrooms over these, you know, just scattered throughout a vast terrain. Um, and it's related to, you know, just looking at a mushroom here this morning that also was riddled with the tunnels. And oftentimes it's the larvae of, of these, but then a whole number of other insects um, that are eating inside. So almost all of this whole flurry of activity with many thousands of miles walked each day, many thousands of miles driven and flown each day is based on Japan's passion for Matsutake. Without this passion and without the kind of money the Japanese are willing to spend, 
probably almost no one would be eating matsutake these days, except for mats. Early in the 1970s, almost every single matsutake eaten in Japan was produced domestically, but for various reasons, and that's another story, domestic production began to plummet. Scientists started to travel around the world and found them in a number of other countries. And these days, some people think that of every 100 matsutake picked around the world, more than 90 are shipped to Japan. And during the fall season, the airports in Japan are just booming with uh, boxes of these mushrooms, many of them now coming from Yunnan. So Yunnan province is where I first came in the mid-1990s, and even at that time, it was a long journey, mainly down bumpy cobblestone roads to the provincial capital. People tried many things. First, they tried taking the mushrooms. They knew that Japanese were interested in them. It was Japanese scientists there uh, who first kind of really thought about them as part of possibility for trade. They would pack them into boxes and cushion them with straw, but sometimes they would spend 40 hours on the truck to make it to the airport. They were broken into pieces. Next, people for years uh, pickled the mushrooms in these giant uh, clay or plastic vats, um, but that was very heavy um, and the value was quite low. But eventually, over time, the infrastructure in Yunnan improved but the other part of the story is that it was really the Matsutake economy, this incredible capital that came in, that improved this infrastructure itself. So it wasn't just coming later on it, it was helping to make it um, happen. So by the early 2000s, Matsutake became Yunnan's most important export crop. And of these many people, everyone had to deal with the insects. The liveliness of the, ins of the mushrooms and the insects they attract affect the trade through and through from the beginning to the end. So in China, few people come from the city to pick matsutake. Instead, most all of the pickers I work with in villages just do a morning's walk in the hills where it grows, and almost all of them are self, largely self-sufficient farmers and pastoralists. Um, and they bring them every day uh, down to meet with the villagers. And they have to contend, and they're continually devising many ways to deal with insects like this gnat, sometimes putting a little greenhouse of plastic over them, sometimes burying the mushrooms underneath a pile of sand, and they can continue to grow because they're not photosynthetic. Um, but one problem is that because so many people are hunting in a relatively small area, it's easy to disguise the mush. It's hard to disguise the mushrooms if you try to keep the uh, insects out. So they're continually um, battling with, with this issue. So not only do the Japanese want matsutake, but they want them fresh. So this creates a much greater difficulty because the insects will still survive in the mushroom after it's picked. This is part of a huge wild mushroom uh, economy. And almost all the other mushrooms can be dry. Once you dry the other mushrooms, you immediately kill the insects then you can even hold on to those dried mushrooms for up to a year while the price fluctuates and, you can, and it can be slow. But the rapidity uh, that drives the mushroom trade is, uh, is mostly by the mushrooms and the fact that, or the insects and the mushrooms and the fact that they have to be fresh, they cannot even be frozen, which would also kill the uh, insects because that changes the texture. So in part, it's the Japanese reception of uh, the mushroom as well that inflects the whole chain. Okay. So now let's go to Japan. So what The emerging world of the Sino-Japanese Matsutake economy, and this is also part of a global one, is dialectic and dynamic. So when I first started to travel to Japan in 2004, I saw that they had long viewed their food production system of continents as orderly, reliable, and safe, especially in comparison to their understandings of China as a place of relative disorder and risk, a place of pollution, and what they called black hearts people who could make fake medicine and toxic toys, they said. Pride in their domestic food was abundantly clear, and the matsutake was regarded as one of the most valued 
and the most emblematic foods of Japanese culture. But after large shipments of, of mushrooms land at the airport, they are inspected for contaminants and are rushed to bulking centers. Here's just a, a slide showing, the, they're hard to see, but there's some of the countries around the world that Japan now collects from. Here's uh, where some of them are brought in, the higher grade ones, and they're sold at auction. People there are uh, bidding right there for their boxes of some of the higher grade ones. And the other ones are uh, put within these uh, giant warehouses. This is not all Matsutake, a number of fresh uh, vegetables kind of things, but these are the kinds of systems that are set up. They're um, you know, set up to basically run for this two or three month season, and it's in the middle of a very quickly uh, moving uh, system. In 2002, Japan found pesticides on a shipment of Chinese matsutake and banned that exporter for the rest of the year. Some such pesticides are likely on the mushrooms because of their species biology, because they attract many species of insects, and humans fight back. And since that time, pesticide detection machines were installed at the major companies within China so that shipments of contaminated mushrooms could be identified before they left. Japan has rigorous standards to guard against low levels of pesticides, and these in turn have rippled through Yunnan. Some dealers argue that China is a land where farmers' fields are right up against the forest, so airborne contamination is quite possible. Some ethnic Tibetans showed me that their diseased grain crops as evidence, saying, we are too poor to buy pesticides to save our crops. We don't use those bad chemicals here. We don't have a problem with that. I was impressed they knew about the fear, but not convinced of their poverty. Their village was dotted with these massive new homes, which some have deemed Matsutake mansions. There is a new organization called the Yunnan Association of Matsutake Exporting Companies that has a new strategy, which is to, to encourage people to use this special satchel. They say that quite correctly when villagers use their own satchel, the contamination from other produce may rub off and contaminate uh, the matsutake that they use later. So this is just one of the things they do. They're trying to make sure that every picker had one and would only use this just for matsutake. Um, but there are many other approaches. And one of the most interesting ones happening now that's in part changing the ways of doing agriculture up in this area, in part because it's such an important part of the Yunnan economy, um, are large-scale efforts by groups like Kunming's Pesticide Eco-Alternative Center. So in some ways, though, the worry about pesticides from foreign foods became less of a central concern after Fukushima. The scale of that disaster was enormous. More than 20,000 people died, and there were more than one million homes and businesses <coughs> destroyed. But the impact of this radiation is less certain in terms of immediately, long-term, and otherwise. And the food landscape has been drastically changed. Uh, the public has been quite skeptical of the government's claims um, to what is uh, clean or not, what are the acceptable levels. Farmers are still allowed to grow grain in the more uh, contaminated areas. And while many people avoid this as best they can, other people in Japan eat what they call loyalty rice. So rice that they know came from the Fukushima area in order to support those farmers. So not everyone is doing the same thing, but it has created a really different understanding of the food um, supply in Japan. And so here we have, this is in grocery stores these days, too, where it has the price, but then also the levels of radiation um, for each product um, there. And there have been a number of uh, cooperative groups of, of people trying to even sometimes buy their own Geiger counter and do the own tests. Um, it turns out that uh, mushrooms, of all things, have an incredible affinity for uh, radiation. Um, although the Japanese scientists have been borrowing off of research done in Chernobyl showing that different species have a very different range. Um, so they're trying to figure out, too, where Matsutake fits. But wild mushrooms have been particularly targeted as one food to avoid as being especially radioactive, which has been very um, distressing 
um, in Japan. And as well, after the incidents, this caused a number of shifts within China. We saw many uh, instances of a kind of panic buy of salt as people tried to eat a lot of iodine to protect themselves from the radiation. They were worried were blown over by the winds. And this is part of a growing Chinese concern, um, something we're all facing now, of course, but particularly acute there, of what my colleague Anna Laura Wainwright calls learning to live with pollution. Um, China is now familiar with being blamed for a significant role in climate change and global pollution. And so some admitted to me that it was a bit of relief um, that people were looking more at Japan than at China. And some dealers thought there might have been a slight boost to the Masataki economy as Japanese consumers became more concerned about their own and relatively less about Chinese products. Okay. So in conclusion, I hope this talk provides some ways of understanding commodity chains and actor network theory frameworks in a slightly different light. Commodity chain analyses are unrepentant in their human focus, and I do not necessarily challenge this. I would like to, however, point out that some organisms come into being through relationships to others and maintain in relation even after humans insert them into the chain. In the case of Matsutake, the presence of insects affects every level of the commodity chain, from their forest habitat to the dinner plate, challenging some of the more mainstream understandings of total human domination. We are increasingly suspicious of such claims to domination, but such presumptions remain built into many of the conventions for understanding the world. Attention to the continuing liveliness of the networks the Matsutake become enmeshed in also calls attention to the ways it is not just a dead commodity severed from the rest of life. In fact, at the long end of a commodity chain, the mushroom you buy, just like the carrots and potatoes and so on that sit next to it in the refrigerator, are often still alive and still growing. When it comes to a and frameworks, however, my intention is more serious. Although a and claims to flatten the world through reducing all participants in a network into actants, it tends to privilege humans as the only ones who actually create networks by enrolling others. If we start to question the concept of enrolling with its association of intentional action, we can start to see that other species, too, are making and living through networks that may or may not have humans directly engaging them at all. This study of the globe-trotting movements of this mushroom, its attractiveness to insects, and its affinity for radiation shows us how the particular species being of these organisms we eat and insert into our international food systems may be continuing to play a more important role than we often realize. Great. Thank you.